When I decided to bring my faith to the forefront of my channel, instead of using it like a backdrop, I knew that I was going to catch grief for that. I mean, in this world, come on, on the internet, being a Christian, you're going to catch grief for that. And I'm not afraid of that. In fact, I would turn this around just using logic and say, if you're coming here to listen to me, to get my views, to get information from me, you should know that I'm a Christian. You should know that that information and that dialogue is coming from a Christian. Now, what I also expected and knew was going to happen, that a lot of that grief will come from other so-called Christians. Christians right now are, are more fractured than they've ever been. The church is really at odds with each other. In fact, Christians are more likely to attack each other than problems or wickedness in the world. That seems to be what they're, they have a propensity to do now more than ever. I think uh, it's easier to attack other Christians than it really is to face the evil in the world. But a lot of people that call themselves Christians are really not living a Christian life. And I'm just going to bring one example, maybe two up to you. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, you got to know what that means. That means you're following Christ and his commandments the best that you can. You got to follow Christ and his commandments. And just one of his commandments is that you are a part of the church. You're a part of the body. That doesn't mean that you have to go to a brick and mortar church, but you have to fellowship with other Christians. With only a couple videos up, I've already had to kind of go back and forth in the comment section with several people on this. There is no option to do this on your own. Now, I go to church at least once a week. I love meeting with other Christians and worshiping Christ together. It's, it's great. I can't even wait to get back there on Sunday. My wife feels the same way, and I'm hoping my kids aren't faking it. They seem to really enjoy it as well. There's nothing like getting together in fellowship. Jesus knew that. That's why he told you, you have to do that. There's not an option to go on your own path. There's not an option just to do it yourself. You're going to be weak and alone, and really you're dead when you're on your own. If you're not part of the body, you're dead. You're not growing. I know this because I've been there. I'm not going to go into it, but I know this as a fact. And it was really hard for me because I'm so independent-minded. And uh, it, took a, it took a long time. It took me a while to try to get into that. But I can tell you, using Scripture, using the commands of Christ, that you have to be a part of this body. And fellowship and the, and the church and the body and the bride, it's all the same. And it has nothing to do with the brick structure. When I go to church, I'm, I'm probably there with a thousand people or more. But you can go to church with two other people or one other person. Whenever two or more of you are together, that can be fellowship. You have to have fellowship. If you don't have accountability, you're really not part of the body. And you're really not following Jesus. You're not following Christ. He's not going to know you if you're not part of the body. You have to understand that. I mean, other ways that I get into trouble being a Christian with other Christians, of course, if they went to seminary, if they belong to some theology or seminary and they've been taught something. I mean, if you've ever talked with somebody from seminary, you'll know that it's probably one of the worst Christian experiences you can have because they've been taught something by somebody else that may not even apply to these times. It's some kind of theology, and uh, you can get into huge disagreements there as well. I don't belong to any theology. I don't belong to any religion. Uh, I'm not interested in what your seminary taught you. I'm interested in Jesus. I'm interested in Scripture, and I'm going to test everything against that. I don't belong to a religion. You have to understand religion to me is some kind of structure or rule, man-made rules, based on the hope that you can jump through enough hoops and do enough things to become a better person or to become pure or to become holy. And that includes a lot of secular religions. You know, evolution's hoping eventually mankind, you know, uh, evolves to a high enough level. You know, they got to work for it. They got to get there somehow. Maybe, maybe they'll be able to do an app or a download and we'll finally be able to come, become holy or pure or smart enough. 
so we can purge the the bad stuff. You know, it's religion is a work of one kind or the other to try to be God or meet God. I don't belong to religion. I'm following Jesus. It's it's the only hope that I have. Are you listening? I'm not telling. I'm not asking you to come with me. It's it's the only hope that I have. And and I know it to be true. That's that's what I'm doing. So I'm putting this uh, this next sermon up that I heard on Sunday because it was such a fantastic sermon. And it talks about belittling or uh, attacking the church. And there are churches. There are individuals that call themselves Christians that are dead. They're away from the body. They're never going to grow. They'll make every excuse up for it. They'll say, oh, I can't find a church. I don't have time for that. They'll serve the world all week, but they don't even have a half an hour or an hour to spend with God. And they'll make every excuse because if they go there, they might get called out. That's the problem. I guarantee you it's pride. They, there might be accountability, which is what the body is all about. If they go to church, they, some of the ideas that they have, it might get called out. Or, God forbid, you have to give a portion of your earnings back. That's another commandment that a lot of Christians have issues with. You know, God, if you look at it that God has given you everything, God's given me so much, and he's asking for a small portion to go back, I don't even think about it. I don't think about it giving it to uh, the church. I think about giving to Jesus. And that, that also I have, uh, I have faltered in. I haven't always believed that. But I'm going to tell you, no matter what excuse you make up, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel like I have to at this time. You have to give a portion of your time or treasure back to be a follower of Christ. There have been times in my life that I have used, that I have given my time. I'll volunteer. But you better tally that up and make sure you're giving the right portion back because he's not going to trust you. If he gives you a little bit and you can't, you can't do it right, he's not going to trust you with a lot. Or worse yet, you're just being strung off into the world. Because you want your stuff. You're trying to hold on to your stuff. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far with this. I'm, I'm just speaking my mind. Um, but I don't want to bump up every time I bump up into somebody's idea of what a Christian is. I want to test everything against Scripture. I'm trying to put this out here, not really for the guys that are non-believers, but I'm talking to you believers right now. You know, I don't want to argue with you about how you feel or this or that. I want to test everything against Scripture. I think that's uh, 1 John 41. Test everything against Scripture. And Scripture tells me that I have to be, as, as much as the, the guy in the world doesn't want this, I have to be part of this bride, part of this church. And I have to have fellowship with other Christians. And again, I think I kind of digressed off of that, but there can be individuals that are dead apart from the body, and there can be whole brick-and-mortar churches that are dead and apart from the body. You have to find a church that is part of the body. You have to find fellowship with Christians that are part of the body. There's lots of Christians out there that are just calling themselves Christians, and they are not. They are not following Jesus Christ. I know, because I've been there. I've been that Christian. So I'm leaving this uh, this sermon up. It was the best sermon I've ever heard on it. And uh, Troy just has a way of putting it out there uh, to be so true. If you want to be a Christian, guys, you got to be part of fellowship. You can't do it alone. You're, you're only fooling yourself. You're just dead. You're not going to grow. You need other men to sharpen against. You need other Christians to sharpen that iron, to get stronger, and to be accountable to I need strong men around me, believe me. <laughs> With the kind of guy and personality that I have, I need strong men to keep me accountable. That's why I need to be part of the body. Anyway, check out this sermon, and I'll talk to you later. Good morning, Grace Church. It's good to see you. Welcome today. I want to welcome those in the chapel, all those who watch online today. Let me, uh, let me pray for us today, and we'll jump in together as we study God's Word. And thank you so much that uh, you, you love us, that your Word says you're for us, not against us, and that you want to know us eternally. 
So whatever it is we don't know today, we pray you would teach us and tell us whatever it is we don't have today and we need to be more effective on our journey, would you please give that to us today? And whatever it is we're not and that we need to be or become to be more like Jesus, would you make us today? We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Well, listen, I, I want to start today by telling you, listen, I love the church, period. I love the church of Jesus Christ. And, and biblically speaking, every Christian should. Unfortunately, every Christian doesn't. And, and I want to share with you today really kind of a, a growing concern and burden that, that, that I have in my heart regarding what I see as it pertains to the, the landscape of the church of Jesus Christ. You know, I, I see that there is this, like there's this growing number of like self-proclaimed Christians trying to do Christianity without the church. A a church-less Christianity, if you will. Now, obviously, no church is perfect, right? You've been around a while, you know that, right? No church is perfect, but no church is perfect precisely because no Christians are perfect, which is why it is like insanely ironic to me that the same people who want the church to be less inauthentic, less hypocritical, less phony, and like a refuge for broken, imperfect, sinful people are also the first ones to leave the church whenever the church is flawed or imperfect. I, I look at that and just feels like a, like a blatant double standard to me. This week, I read a book called Why We Love the Church, and, and in this book, the authors, Ted Clark and Kevin DeYoung, said this. They kind of elaborated, really, on the aforementioned when they said, people, people bemoan the over-programmed church, but then think of a hundred complex, resource-draining things the church should be doing. They, they don't like the church because it's too hierarchical, it's too organized, but then they hate it when it has poor leadership. They, they wish the church could be more diverse, but then leave to meet in a coffee shop with other identical, well-educated 30-somethings who are into Netflix and lattes. They, they want more of a family spirit, but, but too much family, and they'll complain the church is, is inbred. They want the church to know that its reputation with outsiders is like terrible, but then they're really, really critical that the church is too concerned with appearances. They, they chide the church for, for not doing more to address social problems, but then, but then complain when the church gets too political. They want church unity and, and decry denominations, but fail to see the irony in the fact that they have left the church to do their own thing because they can't find a single church that can satisfy them. They're critical of the lack of community in the church, but then want services that allow for individualized worship experiences. They want leaders with passion and vision, but don't want anyone to tell them what to do or how to think. They, they, they want a church where, where people know each other and really love and care for one another, but then complain that the church is an isolated country club only interested in catering to its members. And, and the list, quite honestly, like goes on and on and on. And just for the record today, like I'm, I'm completely good with honesty. Like I'm completely good with looking at the brutal facts and assessing and evaluating. But how about like just a little consistency, right? Like how about a little self-reflection? How about like a little resiliency? How about a little grit? Like for me, like why, why the impatience with the local church? So, so in, in my experience, so I, I've been a senior pastor now for about 23, 24 years. And in my experience, there are like five distinct people groups within the church. Within the church, there's, there's the committed. The, the church, I would say this church has lots of like really, really committed to people. People who love Jesus Christ, who love the world, who love lost people, who love each other, who wanna make a huge dent in the world, a huge difference in the world. And to the committed, here's what I would say. I wanna like, say a huge thank you to you. Like you make the church awesome. 
Like you make the church a joy. You, you make pastoring a pleasure. So here's what I would say. Like, like please keep working hard. Please keep giving consistently. And, and please keep serving steadily. As Paul said in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we'll reap if we do not give up. The second group that, that, that I see kind of in the church at large is a group that I would call the disgruntled. There are, in, in my estimation, a lot of churchgoers still in the church, but kind of perpetually ticked off at the church's limited impact and, and failings. And here's what I say, like I can, I can sympathize to a degree, right? I mean, like, like who doesn't want to be more impactful in the church of Jesus Christ? Who doesn't want the church to be way more, way more of a force in the community? I mean, like we all do. However, here's what I would say, being disgruntled usually leads to disengagement. And so here's what I would say to the disgruntled here today. Why not help a little more and grunt a little less? Does that make sense? If you just help a little more, grunt a little less, it'd be a way better place. And the committed just clapped. Are you all that disgruntled? Like you had a chance to, it was like, mm, mm, mm. right? Use, use your energy, use your influence positively. There's another group I see in the church that I would categorize as like the uninvolved. This, this is the group that just kind of shows up to church but never makes a contribution to the mission, vision, values, direction, life of the church at all. This group isn't disgruntled but are certainly far from gruntled, right? For, for some people, like church is, a, is just a spectator sport. It's just a show. We show up. It's like going to a ball game. We come. We do our thing. We check the box. We go home. Unfazed, untouched by everything that happens. And then there's a group that I would categorize as, as the snipers. Here are the snipers. This is the group that really comes to church with the sole and singular purpose of highlighting the flaws of the church, both now and historically. Snipers, I would say, tend to be a lot like armchair quarterbacks and backseat drivers. Unengaged completely, but experts at everything. Have you met a couple of those folks today? Yeah. Then there's like the disconnected, and I would say this, the disconnected are, are really the ones getting the most press these days. These, these are, are the Christians, or I would say even ex-Christians, who've kind of like written off the church for, a, for an individualistic spirituality. It's kind of the, uh, I, I, I found God on the golf course, like I connect with God at Starbucks or in the mountains or on the lake, kind of a thing. And personally, I just, I just see like a growing movement amongst a lot of people to try to find relationships without accountability and to find God without the church. Now listen, I realize it's really easy to malign and critique the church, but let me remind you, when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, when you became a follower of Jesus Christ, you became the church in that moment. How many of you know that? Like the church is not a building and I'm not like down on the buildings, but the church is not a building. The church is the people. We are you and you are us. That's why I love the corny question. I get it's a corny question, but I love the corny question. What kind of church would this church be if everyone in this church were just like me? That's a good question, by the way, a little corny, a little cheesy, but it's really a good question. You may not even write that down. Like what kind of church would this church be if everyone in this church were just like me? And the truth behind that is, is this, that the church is, is always a reflection of us. And so for me, I kind of laugh, and here's why I laugh. To despise the church is actually an indictment on yourself. So you can't stand outside of it and poke holes at it. You are the church. We are you and you are us. So, so let me give you today, let me give you a different way, a better way, I think, to think about all this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. I want you to think about this. It's a great thought. He said, what if we're meant to demonstrate the presence of God in the world by joining a visible institution, the church? Let me tell you what he means by that. He means that the body of Christ, when we gather together corporately as God's people, we come together, 
We become visible to the world as we gather around the Word of God and the Son of God in the power of the Spirit of God to spread the good news of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. He goes on to say, without the institutional church, there may be less to despise about Christianity, but there would also be, now hear this, there would also be more of an invisible bride to love and less of a visible Christ to see. And so for people who are like, you know what, I just do my own thing individually. I just hang out at Starbucks with two or three people. How do people know you're the church? They don't know you're the church. You're, you're the invisible church. An invisible church is for invisible Christians. The visible church is for visible Christians. And so here's what people know. There are a bunch of people, people in this community look and go, there are a bunch of people in this place, in this institution, in this organization that take God seriously. Like they recalibrate their lives, they recenter their lives around the word of God and son of God and want to make a huge deal over Jesus. And they're serious about it. They gather together every single week. They have activities and programs throughout the course of the week to advance the cause and purpose of Jesus Christ. And so here's what I would say. It's like imperative for you to know that the church is not an appendage to the gospel. It is itself a part of the gospel. John Stott said it this way. I couldn't say it any better. It's a brilliant way to say it. He said, churchless Christianity makes about as much sense as a Christless church and has, hear this, has just as much biblical warrant. And so here's what Stott did. Stott started assessing the move of God throughout the book of Acts and what God did in saving people and what he did with the people that he saved. Listen to his assessment. He said this. He said, the Lord didn't add people to the church without saving them. And he didn't save people without adding them to the church. So it's not like he just did a, a, a great work and saved people to go do their own thing. He saved people and then he placed them in a group of other believers, a group of other believers. He said salvation and church membership went together and they still do. Al Mohler said this, an attitude of indifference to the church has become tragically common within American Christianity. And as a result, many people fail to make a solid commitment to congregational life and responsibility. And this is what he says, the New Testament is clear, to love Christ is to love the church. Would you say that with me? To love Christ is to love the church. Now, some of you are going, hold up, hold up. Are you saying to me that, are you saying to me that I don't love Christ if I don't love the church? Well, here's what I say. Like, I don't know your heart, but I would say this without a doubt. You don't understand the New Testament for sure if you don't understand what the Bible says about loving Christ and loving the church. I can say that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so today, like, here's my burden. Today, I want to give you like, like six biblical reasons to love the church of Jesus Christ. Like six biblical reasons to like give your life to the church of Jesus Christ. So if you pull out your outlines, we can track along together here. Number one, the first biblical reason here to love the church is because Jesus founded the church. The church is Jesus's idea. The church is Jesus's vision. Listen to Paul's description in Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. He says this, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, in Christ, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the spirit. Let me tell you what Paul is saying. Paul is saying here that we, when we trust in Jesus Christ, we, we get grafted into a movement. A movement started by Jesus, an institution founded by Jesus, built upon the prophets and the apostles. So when we like join in and become community in a place called the church, we're, we're continuing to build upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Jesus Christ being the centerpiece, the cornerstone. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that Jesus is, is the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. No human being is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. He's the cornerstone. He's the centerpiece. Jesus is the mastermind 
of this concept called the church. The church is his invention. It is his movement. It is his organization. And it is, hear this, his plan to redeem and disciple the world. And so listen, to malign the church is to undermine the founder of the church, Jesus Christ himself as well. I mean, mean, just, just think about it logically for a moment. Do you think that Jesus didn't know there'd be issues and struggles in the church? Like when he, when he had this whole grand vision and this whole idea to pull together a bunch of redeemed slash sinful people. Do you think that, that we, we caught him off guard? I mean, he absolutely knows that we're going to deal with issues and struggles. And yet he still chooses to use people to advance his mission. And so listen, we should. One reason we should love the church is because Jesus created the church. Jesus founded the church. I hear people say like, well, I I planted the church. You didn't plant a church. Jesus planted the church. It's all his vision. It's all his idea. It's all his movement. The second reason that every Christian should love the church is because Jesus died for the church. Jesus founded the church and Jesus died for the church. Now, I, I remember feeling called to ministry and being a seminary student. And I remember being in the cafeteria, the seminary that I attended and sitting at a table with a bunch of young, arrogant guys going into ministry. And we were all like taking our pot shots at the church and talking about how we were gonna do anything but serve in the church and maligning the church. And I remember a professor overheard the conversation and said something to the effect of this. How dare you, how dare you denigrate what Jesus gave his life to create? And then he shared with me this verse I'm going to share with you. Acts 20, 28. And by the way, that like hit me pretty hard. Look what this verse says. So Luke writes to the elders in the book of Acts and says this, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. And I saw that and I realized that the church was built on the crucified back of Jesus. So so like how precious is the church? Here's what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So here's why the church is valuable. Here's why the church is precious because Jesus Christ paid for it with his own life. So we've got to be really, really careful not to denigrate what Christ shed his blood for, what Christ gave his life to create. And so for me, I'm, I'm just thinking like, to like just write off the church to, to not give to the church, to not contribute in the church, to not try to build up Christ's church is to not take seriously what Jesus died to create. In my mind, it's really kind of an insult to his sacrifice where he laid out his life so we could have life. The third reason Christians should love the church is because Jesus is only building one institution. He's only building one institution. So in the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 18, you get the first mention of the word church in the New Testament. It's a Greek word, ekklesia. It means the called out assembly. So God calls us to himself, conversion, and then he calls us together as the church. And then he calls us out to advance his mission. And look at what he says here. I tell you, 16, 18, that you're Peter and on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now real quickly here, just think about this. With all that Jesus could have done while he was on planet earth, with all that Jesus like might have done while he was on planet earth, he only built and promised to bless one institution, the church. So notice his language, he said, I will build my church church. Notice those personal pronouns. You you see this, you see that Jesus is possessive of his church. We're going to talk more about that in just a few moments. The fourth reason that we should love the church is because Jesus guaranteed the church is going to win in the end. How many of you know that? 
He's guaranteed that the church is going to win in the end. Look at that last phrase in Matthew 16, 18. What's he say? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So I'm a part of a winner and you're a part of a winner. I don't want to be on a losing team and you don't want to be on a losing team. So if you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, you're on the winning team. And here's the deal. Christ has guaranteed the church's victory with really, really strong language. The gates of hell will not prevail or overcome the church. So here's the logic in Matthew 16. Death is is Satan's most powerful weapon. We know that he first used it on Christ. And he thought that if he could kill the builder of the church, then he could kill the church. I don't know if you've read the story of the Bible, because here's the story. The builder of the church actually came out of the grave. As well, all throughout the history of the church, Satan has endeavored to slaughter the church, to wipe the church out. People have died as martyrs. How many of you know that people are still dying as martyrs for the sake and cause of Jesus Christ? And yet Satan can't stamp out the church. And listen, any student of church history will tell you that the blood of the martyrs becomes the seed in which the church flourishes. And so here's what we know. The church is victorious. The church is going to be victorious. You're a part of something that cannot lose. And not because of you, not because of me, but because of Jesus. How many of you are glad to know that today? Amen. Like that's good news. It's good news. That's why, listen, if you read Hebrews 12, you'll see the church triumphantly in heaven. You come to Revelation chapter 4 and you see the church represented by 24 elders and they're singing, praise to the lamb, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Why? Let me tell you what that means. We're a part of something that is a winner in the sense that it's eternal, in a sense that it's everlasting. And so I don't know about you, but I have just decided... I am pouring my life into the church that Jesus is building, knowing that Satan's most powerful weapon, death itself, cannot stop it. The church is an unstoppable force that Jesus created. And we want to be a part of that. Number five, the fifth reason to love the church is because Jesus loves the church. Jesus loves the church. How do we know Jesus loves the church? He gave himself up for her. Now, I don't have time to read these two passages. I want you to write them down. I want you to write down Ephesians 5, 22 to 33, and Revelation 19, 6 through 9. So, so to summarize, Jesus founded the church. Yep. Jesus died for the church. Yes. But Jesus also loves the church. Like Jesus Christ makes the church beautiful. Now, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 borrows from, from the picture of marriage. It talks about a husband and a wife, male and female. It borrows from this picture of one man, one woman, and gives us a, a visual of what the church should be like and how the church then should interface with and relate to Jesus. And it says this, that Christ is the groom and the church is his bride. Christ is the groom, the church is his bride. And so in that dynamic, out of that relationship, the church submits to Jesus. The church grows in in beauty before him. The church obeys his commands. And in a sense, just like in marriage, a male and female, husband and wife become one. In, in a sense, spiritually speaking, Christ being the groom, the church being the bride, the, the two are also one now in preview and later in fullness, but they're still one. So, so we, the church, Jesus the groom, are, are to be as inseparable as husband and wife. And here's the thing. Any husband like worth the paper his marriage license is printed on, will be jealous to guard the good name of his wife. Now, she may be a lying, no good, homely, double-crossing, poor excuse for a wife, but if she's your wife, you'll protect her honor, whatever's left of it. 
And woe to the friend who comes around your house, hangs out at your house and expects to have a good time at your house, all the while taking digs and shots at your bride. I mean, like who wants a friend who rolls his eyes and sighs every time your wife talks or walks into a room? Like no one, right? So listen, don't ever forget, don't ever forget the church is the bride of Jesus Christ He loves his bride. He cares for his bride. And he will one day present his bride blameless before God in heaven. So in the same way, listen, in the same way, anyone who maligned my wife, Sherry, before me would have issue then with me. Anyone who maligns the church will have to take it up with Jesus. It's exactly what Paul tells us here. That's why this is one of the reasons we should love the church. I should should stop here. Like, that's so good. We should just quit. Jesus loves the church. You should love what Jesus loves. He gave his life for the church. His sacrifice should mean something to you. It's insulting to him when we don't take seriously his sacrifice. So the sixth and final reason that we should love the church is because the church is the body of of Jesus Christ. So let me explain this. How does, how does Jesus do his work in the world? Like how has he set it up where he has influence and impact in the world? Let me tell you how he's done that. Through the body, through the people, through the church. And Jesus himself is the head. And here's what we know. Everybody needs a head to rule over it to give it direction, to give it guidance, to give it purpose, to instruct it in the way it should go, to hold things together, to give members life and meaning and nourishment, right? Like, and I would say this, likewise, every head needs a body. Every head needs a body. So I suppose in a world of science fiction, heads could exist like hooked up to a car battery or something. But in the real world, right, most of us don't see too many heads just kind of bobbing along apart from bodies. Like that'd be a strange, strange sight. And so Christ allows us his body to represent him in the world, to serve him in the world. He uses us, his body, to accomplish his purposes in the world. And so in in closing, let me say this as clearly as I can. The church is not an incidental part of God's plan. The church is the hope of God of the world. And that's you. That's me. And Jesus, listen, Jesus didn't invite people to an individualistic, anti-church, anti-doctrine, anti-institutional Christian lifestyle. He didn't. I hear some people say, you know, I don't like the church. It's, it's too organized. It's too institutionalized. Well, here's something you need to think about. I like showing up to church knowing that there are people that have thought about me coming. I like showing up to church knowing that uh, that there are gonna be children, workers in the nursery. So when I drop my kid off, there's someone to care for that person. And so this whole idea that we have to be free flowing, you know, ooey gooey. Listen, you gotta have a little bit of organization to make the thing go. And that shouldn't be something that, that you despise. It should be something that you actually celebrate. And so here's what we know, like Jesus called the church out. He called us to be his bride. He called us to be his body. He called us to represent him. He called us to advance his agenda. He called us to be his ambassadors. And so can I say this? Don't give up on the church. Like don't give up on the church. It's God's plan of redemption for the world. Moreover, listen. The New Testament knows absolutely nothing of this this church-less Christianity. The invisible church is for invisible Christians. The visible church is for you and for me. That said, let me close with some thoughts here. A bunch of just stream of consciousness, okay? Find a good local church. Find one. I hope it's here. If it's not here, okay. Find a good local church and engage. Get involved, like dig in, settle in, engage. 
worship consistently, corporately. Don't let the worship of God with God's people be the very first thing that you nix when your schedule fills up. Make worship a priority. It's good for you. It's good for your kids. And it brings glory to God. I would say this, give courageously, give generously. I was thinking about that verse that Pastor Dave quoted, that God loves cheerful givers. We know that. Does that mean that God doesn't love uncheerful givers? I don't know what that means, but I know that he loves cheerful givers. I think he, he doesn't like you, but he loves you. I'm, I'm just kidding. I think he still likes you. <laughs> but like give generously, right? Here's what I would say. Be patient with your leaders. They're flawed. You had a, thank you very much for the amen. <laughs> you, you had a shot right there. Like that was like a softball for you to go, hey, like, they're flawed. Be patient with your leaders and leaders need to be patient with other leaders. Here's, here's, here's what you're going to find out. Nobody in this church is perfect, but Jesus. That's why we worship him. That's why we talk about him. We preach sermons about him. That's why we're all about him. Here's what I would say. Rejoice when the gospel is proclaimed. Don't go, yeah, I've heard that before. Rejoice when the gospel is preached and proclaimed. And you should never get over the gospel being preached and proclaimed. You should never get over that. You should only go into more profound understanding of how significant the living, dying, and rising again of Jesus Christ actually is. Here's what I would say. Cheer when people get it. Cheer when people get it. I was walking down the hallway on my way in here from Next Steps. And there was a guy sitting in a chair and he's like, come here, come here, come here. And I walked over there and he's like, this lady five minutes ago, just trusted in Christ. High five. We, we, listen, we, we should never, ever like get over that when, when people get it. Here's what I would say. Sing like you mean it. Jesus knows if you're faking it. I'm watermelon, 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 watermelon. He knows. Sing like you mean it. Here's what I say. Serve in the nursery once in a while. And all the young mamas said, amen. Like give them a break. Don't go, man, I'll serve anywhere but in there. You, you should want to get your hands on that next generation. And we can learn a thing or two about the humility and the beauty of those babies. Amen. The one thing you learn is that there is a sin nature in a two-year-old. How many of you know that? <laughs> you learn the doctrine of original sin. So if you don't believe in original sin, go to the nursery. It'll be a primer in theology for you. You'll learn really, really quickly. Listen, don't retire from serving. A lot of you are like, you know, I've done my tour of duty. I've heard people say, like, I've done my time. You've done your time. What is this? You know, Alcatraz? Are you in a penitentiary? You've done your time. What? Don't retire from serving. Listen, invite a friend to church. Snipe less. Pray more. Be thankful that someone vacuumed the carpet. Be thankful that someone cleaned the toilets for you. Be thankful for that, right? Here's what I say. Don't, don't despise the small things. And love Jesus. Love Jesus. And love, love what Jesus loves. Love the church. The church has some issues. She has some flaws. You're flawed. I'm flawed. You have issues. I have issues. And God loves us. Isn't it beautiful? And he saved us. And he's called us together. Not just in community. It's deeper than just community. It's into brotherhood and sisterhood. That we, that we love one another that we sacrifice for one another. That when one of us weeps, we all weep. When one of us has joy, we're all joyful. Because we've got each other's back. We're the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? We're the church of Jesus Christ. And so maybe today, as we pray, maybe you just like need to like, repent of like your lack of engagement, your lack of involvement. Maybe you like, like me need to repent of like taking shots at maligning 
the body of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the groom, we're the bride. You're talking about his bride. Think about how offended you would be, men, husbands, if someone were maligning, taking shots at your bride. I mean, we would have to hold you back. We would. So maybe you need to re repent of maligning Christ's body. Maybe today some of you are like, you know what? Like, count me in. I want to give my life to what Jesus gave his life for. Give my life to it. He gave his life for it. I want to give my life to what Jesus gave his life for. So count me in. I want to make a difference. I want to serve. I want to give my life away. I'm not trying to be a hero. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. I can be anonymous. I can come together with the body of Jesus Christ and we can make a huge dent and difference in the world for his fame and his honor and his glory. We should all want that. Amen. We should all want that as the church of Jesus Christ. We should all want that. Some of you need to like, you know what? You need to plant your flag here. Like some of you, I've run into you and I love you, man. But you've been coming here a really, really long time. You've been like dating us forever. <laughs> and I would say the church is always worth marrying. And if it's not us, I get it. I get it. But go find a place to plug in. We, we date the church. We, sh we, we should love the church. We should take the church way more seriously than that. We just should. And so today, listen, we, get, we have all kinds of opportunities for you to, to respond in service. We have kind of a get engaged, get connected banner in the commons. Jump in and serve. Jump in and serve. And here's what I would say, like, like financially, we are way better than what we're seeing. We just are. It's not like one person's gonna like carry the ball for all of us. But like, we're way better than what we're presently doing here as a church family. Like I've walked through the parking lot and I see the cars that are parked out there. Like, you know what I mean, right? I mean, we can do way better than what we're doing. We really can. And why wouldn't you want to give to something where it's making a difference along with a lot of other people to, to, to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? So, so love the church. Be generous to your church. It's your, it's your church. I know somebody like, oh, I don't, I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my money. Well, I'm, I'm not telling you what to do with your money. The Bible says give and be generous. And here's the thing, like as the membership, you, 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 you have the, the responsibility and opportunity at the end of the year. You decide on where the money is going. You vote on it. And so we, we give you recommendations. In the end, you decide by a thumbs up or a thumbs down on all that. And I don't know about you, when, when I give, here's how I think about it. I just give to Jesus. <laughs> I just give to him. And I, I just want him to know I love him. So it's not about, well, here's what I think about this, that, or the other. I just, I just want to give to him. I want him to see that I know he's blessed me and I, I just want to be generous to him. It's that simple, I think. And so, and so let me ask you a question. Do we need to take up the offering again? I'm just, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, seriously? No, I'm not serious. But we've got to step it up. We've got to, we've, we've got to step it up and be the church, the visible church, so this community can see the power of Christ demonstrated in and through our lives. And we can advance the gospel here, near, and far away. And it's 10 to 12. We're done. Let's stand together. Doesn't it feel like a victory when I get done, like before 12? Does it feel good to you that way? <laughs> like, yes, 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 it feels so good. I always felt that way as a little kid. We got out before 12. Sweet. But listen, I love you guys. Grateful for you. Let's make a difference together. Let's be the church, let's love the church that Jesus loves. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you died to give us life and that today we learn and see that uh, you created the church. You died for the church. You love the church. The church is your body in this world and you wanna make a difference in this world through this body. 
And so help us to humble ourselves. God, we do repent today for a lack of involvement or engagement. We repent of maligning Christ's body, knowing that, that we're your bride in all of our chinks in the armor that you love us. And we thank you for that. And so today, God, I pray that uh, all of us would plant our flags, all of us would be counted as in, and that we would make a difference for the fame and glory and honor of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So empower your church today as we leave this place. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Have a blessed week.